Think you've seen peak performance? Well, I'm not here just to play the overclocking game drenched in liquid helium for some fleeting moment of glory. No, I'm here with something far more sustainable and no less extraordinary. Introducing the world's fastest non-overclocked desktop PC. It's the AMD Storm Peak Beast that's resetting all of the benchmarks. Maybe you try it. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Before we unveil the Titan, let's pay homage to its venerable predecessor, the Threadripper 3970X, nestled in its Gigabyte Aorus Extreme TRX40 motherboard throne, sporting 128 gigabytes of RAM. Built three years ago when the 3970X was among the crown jewels of CPUs, it still flexes considerable multi-core muscle, mowing down compilation tasks like a digital Goliath. Backed by an RTX 4080 thanks to NVIDIA, this machine isn't just a graphics powerhouse. It's my own personal CUDA experimentation lab. And while solving primes may not be as glamorous as gaming, it does host a private show of DALI-like stable diffusion right on the desktop. Limitless, lightning-fast AI image generation right on my own PC. And what's a high-tech chariot without a dazzling display of lights? Not just any lights, mind you, but a symphony of RGB orchestrated by the ingenious fanset project from NightDriverLED.com. Watch as the hues dance in sync with the CPU's thermal heartbeat, a visual testament to the machine's might. Night Driver is smart enough to be able to draw the fans radially or as a canvas, allowing for an impressive set of effects. In this case, the fan activity is actually mapped to CPU temperature, and here's how the machine looks running Prime 95 on all its cores. If I stop that and allow the CPU to return to idle, the LEDs soon go to a calm blue state. I'm obviously a big RGB fan, and everything here other than the PDP-11 is run by ESP32 modules. These chips can be had for as little as $2, and I have now made a hobby out of seeing how much colored visual awesomeness I can extract from their dual 240MHz cores. Here's an example of it running a Hub75 matrix doing a Christmas tree effect, and here's an example of it drawing a live spectrum analyzer display. And out here in the shop, it can get chilly in the winter, and so no PC is complete without its very own little desktop fireplace. Which is actually just one of about 50 different effects, and they're fully open source, so check it all out at NightDriverLED.com. But now, let's pivot to the main event. The new champion of silicon, the Threadripper 7995WX. With the heart of a Ryzen 9 and the brawn of 96 cores, this PC is no mere upgrade, it's a major evolution. As we dive deep into the technological alchemy between the old and new, brace for insights that challenge what you thought possible from a desktop workstation. If you're a fan of the channel, you've already seen me doing the initial benchmarks in previous episodes, so you know precisely what it is. How did I wind up with it? Well, that's a bit of a story in itself. As I mentioned earlier, my current Threadripper is a powerhouse, and the single-core performance is state-of-the-art. For three years ago. Which is to say I've been very fortunate, but I'd trade it all for a little more. So if I could somehow get contemporary single-core performance combined with the Threadripper multi-core power, it'd be perfect. Throughout the year, I started to hear rumors about Storm Peak, the new generation of Threadripper, and became really excited about the prospect of upgrading my 3970X. I reached out to AMD to see if there was any chance that I might get a demo unit, and they connected me with HP, who was just readying the release of their new HP Z6 G5A workstation. Being clever, I made sure to explain that the primary things I wanted to do with it were to pit it against the Primes Project and the Language Drag Racing series, which we will do in upcoming episodes. So it was sort of implicit that while I currently had 32 cores, if they could somehow spare something with even more cores, it would be even better. When of course compiling large source bases was a primary use case as well. So they agreed to send me a workstation loaner to evaluate, but I had no real idea what the configuration would be. Beggars can't be choosers after all. A week or two later, the box showed up at my door, and so I eagerly trucked it on into the shop and fired it up on the workbench to see what was inside. I didn't even open the case. I went straight ahead and connected a mouse and keyboard to it and booted it. It had four display ports only and no HDMI, because the inside is actually an A4000, and it fast booted quickly enough that I didn't even see a post screen. So as soon as I got to the desktop, I opened my old friend Task Manager to see what fury HP had wrought. And I was not disappointed. Not only does it feature the new Threadripper 7000 series, this one has the biggest and baddest of them all. The 96-core, 192-thread monster, the top of the line, 7995 WX Pro. It is literally the fastest CPU you can buy, and that includes being faster than the very best 128-core epics. Now, to save you from having to fast-forward to the benchmarks and miss the cool stuff, I'll just give you the benchmarks now, and then we can have some fun with it. 
Let's start by having a look at the Passmark CPU leaderboards to see just where it stacks up. As you can see, the 7995WX tops the chart with a score of 153,096, outpacing the top Intel offering by about a solid 50%. It even beats the top Epic by more than 20%, and that's on all cores. To compare it to my 3970X Threadripper, we have to scroll down the chart. Way, way down the chart, which is a bit surprising given how powerful it still feels in daily use. But the 3970X scores 63,000, a mere 40% of what the new chip churns out. Of course, with any chip, there's fast and then there's faster. If a chip can be overclocked, you can rest assured someone will do it, and the new Threader for 7995 is notable for not being an exception here. Both the frequency and the power limits are unlocked, meaning you can achieve some really stellar numbers on the test bench. And here's the reason we're not going to go that way. Like a dyno pull with the wastegates dialed all the way up, it's a great way to produce some heroic short-term numbers, but it's just not sustainable. Synthetic benchmarks are all well and good, but it's even better when you can put the chip through its paces in what I'd call its native habitat. And the 7995 in the HP Z6 is the apex predator in the software development space. When it comes to code, speed of compilation makes you king of the jungle. And as we'll see, there's none faster. Before we do that, however, I've got to confess that after using this workstation for a couple of weeks, I'm pretty stoked about it. As in, when HP wants it back, it's going to be like that Seinfeld episode where Kramer keeps dodging the cable guy. They'll have to catch me first. But in all seriousness, I want to reiterate that any enthusiasm for and any reservations I might have about this chip are based on actually using it for what it is intended for. This is not a sponsored episode. I haven't talked to HP about it. They don't get to see it first. And my worst case scenario is that they demand it back right away because I think I'm in love. Now, I'm fully cognizant of the fact that very few people are going to be able to run out and spend north of $10,000 on just their CPU. But somebody has to do the important journalistic test scenarios, and so it might as well be me. And that's why my first real stress test for the machine was to see how many copies of Doom I could run at once. I did a whole episode on it, then I started with Chocolate Doom, a standalone Doom port, but I couldn't get much past 50 copies. It just doesn't multitask well. So I decided instead to run a web server that would allow me to play the Doom game in a browser window, and then I launched as many copies of Doom at the local URL as I could muster. Now it's important to point out here that if I'm running 100 copies of Doom, I'm also running 100 copies of Chrome, and some people rightly pointed out that perhaps Chrome itself is heavier than Doom, and it might be, at least in a single instance. But when we have 100 instances, because of the way copy on write works, all you're really going to have excess for each individual incremental copy is the RAM that it allocates, because any of the code space is all going to be mapped to the same pages in memory anyway. Without getting too deep into the weeds on it, the fastest solution I was able to find was the browser solution. Now, I could have run them all in individual tabs, which might have been more efficient for the browser, and instead I ran them as individual windows so I could tile them all. However, I want to be able to see them paint. Long story short, the Threadripper laughed at 100 copies. It was barely using 10% of the CPU at that point. By 200 copies, you could tell things were taking longer to launch, but everything still ran at pretty much the full frame rate. 500 copies is as far as I could get with what I'd call acceptable performance. At 1,000 copies, the machine was useless for pretty much anything other than the currently active Doom session, though all of the copies continued to paint at what looked to be their full frame rate. So I seemed to be running out of resources long before I was running out of CPU. My suspicion, and it was supported by a conversation with a former Win32k.sys developer named Fritz, is that portions of the windowing system itself are single-threaded still, and so at some point, the system can't scale the UI itself beyond a certain number of windows or window messages. Now, that's not a limitation of the Windows kernel, it's just a limitation of the window manager. But it's a wholly reasonable one, because running a thousand concurrent copies of anything with a user interface and menus and all that isn't a realistic scenario for most users. So after the Doom test, I wanted to see how fast this machine could actually compile code. So first, I unleashed it on the Linux kernel, which normally takes a couple of minutes, even on a pretty fast machine. It peeled off a fresh kernel in just 26 seconds. In other words, it was able to compile the entire Linux kernel more quickly than some Linux machines can boot it. That really meant I needed a bigger code base, something that the Threadripper could really sink its teeth into. But I didn't want to compare it to just my old Threadripper. I wanted a build of something that was something of a standard benchmark too, and it turns out that compiling the Chromium source code fits nicely. It includes the V8 JavaScript engine, the Blink rendering engine, the Chromium browser, and several other components. On a 64-core top-of-the-line Threadripper from the last generation, the fastest build I was able to find online came in at 34 minutes. 
In my last video, I showed you how to enlist in and build the chromium tree, so for today, we'll just concern ourselves with the actual results. And suffice to say, they were impressive. The HP Z6 tore through the build in just 18 minutes and 20 seconds, shaving almost 50% off the very fastest comparison builds. To get that result, however, I had to limit the build to only 128 threads. That's because on capped, on my machine with 128 gigabytes, it will try to run 192 parallel copies of the compiler with only 128 gigabytes, and I simply didn't have enough memory. When you run it a physical RAM, the system will give you virtual memory that is backed by swap space on disk, but even with an SSD, paging is way slow by comparison. By limiting the build to 128 copies of the compiler, I was able to just sneak in under 128 gigabytes. But I could already hear the protests. We need to know what it can do when it's not limited by RAM. So hearing your plaintive cries in advance, I promptly ordered 384 gigabytes of new memory in the appropriate speed and type and installed it. And my system got marginally slower. No matter what I did, I could not break under 19 minutes anymore. Since they were the same speed, as far as I can tell, I'm surprised that going from 8 16 gigabyte sticks to 8 48 gigabyte sticks would slow it down. But that's what I experienced. If you have a good theory as to why that might be, I would love to hear it. The only other difference that I can think of is that these are 2R, 2 rank, instead of 1 rank. Other than that, they all spec out the same. So I went back to 128 threads, 128 gigabytes, and for now, 18 minutes and 20 seconds is as fast as I could go. So by now, I've hopefully convinced you that the 7995WX gives the HP Z6 some scalding performance. The big thing is that each of the cores is essentially a modern Ryzen 9 core, so it's pretty sprightly for quick and nimble single-threaded performance. But like a humpback hidden just under the waters, though, even more massive power lurks just beneath the surface. Now it's time to take a more in-depth look at how the 7995 achieves these performance gains. What's really changed since the 3970? Well, first off, we have the memory. We've increased the speed from DDR4-3200 to DDR5-5200. Moreover, on this pro platform like the HP Z6, the number of active memory channels has doubled from 4 to 8, giving you an astonishing 332 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. Next, we have the caches. The L2 cache is growing from 16 megabytes to 96 megabytes, and the L3 cache triples from 128 megabytes to 384 megabytes. The 7995 brings advanced PCI 5 support with 128 lanes and increased bandwidth. It's also manufactured with 5 nanometer technology versus the 7 nanometer of the 3970. In terms of processing power, the 7995WX features 96 cores and 192 threads, which is a significant jump up from the 3970's 32 cores and 64 threads, though of course a 64 core version was available in that generation as well, but not a 96. And finally, there is the higher overall TDP, which jumps from 280 watts to 350 watts. And of course, the 7995 makes even more efficient use of those actual watts than the 3970 did three years ago. Also, going from 7 to 5 nanometer helps a fair bit. All of these factors combine to produce some truly impressive performance numbers, but is there even more that can be unleashed through overclocking? And the answer is somewhere between yes with a but and no with an unless because it depends on who makes your machine and your BIOS. With a machine from a trusted OEM, it's almost certainly going to be locked to the 350 watt power limit. OEMs have no real interest in pushing over clocking limits while they're supporting the board under warranty and so forth. But if you can find a motherboard with the VRMs to do it, I've seen reports of this chip pushing nearly 700 watts with adequate cooling. And speaking of cooling, that's one thing that's actually made easier by the Threadripper's chiplet design, which distributes those 96 cores over a broad section of this big chip's area. The thing is, the new 7970X with just 32 cores can still push 350 watts, which means a great majority of that heat is going to be produced in a much smaller and more concentrated space. This, in turn, means you get far less effective coverage from the heat plate in your cooler than you do when the same 350 watts is distributed over a much greater area of the cooler. Now, I don't have any Patreons, and I'm not selling anything. I'm just in this for the subs and likes. So please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. In the meantime, and in between time, hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.